Thank you, Julie. Appreciate it. What number is how Hunter's points out? Hunter's points out. It is oh, 221 is the very first one. The only thing that HP requested if after we are done with council member Van Bramer, we could do R. Because they have somebody from there. From here, yes, we can start with the book too, so you could read, start reading it. I'll talk to you through it. Good afternoon and welcome to the subcommittee on planning dispositions and concessions. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos, Chair of the subcommittee. You can tweet me at Ben Kalos. We're joined today by Council Members uh, Ruben Diaz Sr., who is here early and on time as always, and Council Member Chaim Deutsch, who uh, I hope you'll come a little closer to me so he might be able to sub in. Uh, today we'll be holding a hearing on four projects which have several applications, Hunter Point South, Sunset Parks 1 through 4, Hobson's Park Place and 21 Arden Street. If you're here to testify, please fill out a white speaker slip with Sergeant at Arms and indicate the land use number of the item you wish to testify on on that slip. Uh, we also have a, a guest star, uh, Jimmy Van Bramer. Uh, before we begin our hearings, we'll vote on three applications in Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan, which were subjects of hearings on September 17th. Land use items 22, 20. Land use items 223, 224, and 225 are related to property at 95 Lenox Avenue in Central Harlem section of Manhattan. The project known as Canaan Four Towers is a Section 8 building comprised of 161 dwelling units on 11 floors with two elevators. That is your emergency alert going off. Those watching at home, do not worry. You, If you're watching it after the fact, there is nothing to be alarmed about because this happened before. Uh, it was built in 1981, is granted an exemption under the Article 5 of the Private Housing uh, Finance Law. Uh, and uh, it turns out those beeps were just a test of the National Wireless Emergency Alert System. No action is needed. Uh, it was part of a planned project will expire in 2021. The building Section 8 contract is currently set to expire in 2033. Land use item 223, HPD seeks approval pursuant to Section 115 of the Private Housing Finance Law, the modification of the plan and project of Kinan 4 Towers, Block 1824, Lot 16 and 155, removing from the plan and project Block 1824, Lot 155, currently containing a parking lot and open space. Lot 16, which contains the aforementioned existing Section 8 building, will remain in the plan and project until it expires. For land use item 24, HPD seeks approval for conveyance of the parking lot and open space from the current owner to a new owner who will redevelop with two new buildings, a 40% income restricted 60% market rate building containing approximately 288 dwelling units, assuming a future rezoning and 100% income restricted ELA building potentially containing approximately 209 dwelling units. Proportion of lot 155 is combined with HPD owned lots 19, 20, and 21. The third action land use item 225 is for approval of pursuant to section 123, subsection 4. It's one of my favorite sections of the law, 1234. Uh, the private housing finance law, the voluntary dissolution of the current owner of Manhattan's block 1824, lot 16, the existing section 8 building, to remain an approval of a new tax exemption for pursuant to section 577 of Article 4, Article 11 of the private housing finance law. Uh, Council Member Perkins is supportive of this application and has uh, submitted a letter in support. Uh, before voting, I'd like to just note that if you're interested in seeing the uh, letter from Councilmember Perkins, you can find it on the Council website. I now call for a vote to approve land use items 223, 224, and 225. The Council could please call the roll on her first hearing as Council. Thank you, Chair. Chair Kalos? Aye and all. Uh, Deutsch? Aye. Diaz? Aye and all. The land use sorry, items are approved by a vote of um, three in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions, and will be referred to the full land use committee. And, and we will uh, hold the vote open. And as we do so, we see uh, our uh, council member, Vanessa Gibson, who will vote. Uh, vote on land use items 223, 224, and 225 related to 95 Lenox Avenue. Council Member Gibson. I vote aye. The 
final vote is four in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions, and these items will be referred to the full land use committee. I'm fine handing over to council. Uh, are we expecting anyone else? Or are we? Yeah. That vote is now closed. Uh, be before I go any further, I just want to share that uh, it, for, for many employees, you get to take a sick day. Elected officials, sometimes we get to take a sick day. Uh, so I, I, th this is me just sharing with the general world at large because uh, 168,000 of you are my employees. Employers, uh, that I am feeling a little bit under the weather. So uh, just as a full disclosure, uh, it's not the easiest to read today, and I may have to step out of the hearing every now and then, and I will hope that uh, my committee council can uh, step in every here and there. Uh, that being said, uh, the show must go on. Uh, we will now start a public hearing. First, we will start with land use items 221 and 222, Hunters Point South and Councilmember Van Brammer's District in Queens, uh, which we will hear together. I will uh, now go to uh, Councilmember Van Bramer for any statement he wishes to make on the record. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Kalos. And uh, it is uh, a significant uh, amount of progress that we've made and that I believe uh, some folks will, will speak to now. But uh, items numbers 221 and 222 uh, represent uh, a project that has certainly been known about and worked on for a very long time and obviously has been uh, through a series of approvals already but what we're going to be doing today is making it even better so the UDAP application presented here uh, is providing for two new schools for this community uh, which so desperately needs additional school seats um, and it's not increasing the number of total units uh, but instead is actually increasing the number of affordable units and uh, bringing uh, AMIs down uh, as low as 30 percent. So this project, while it's been in the works for a very long time, and again, uh, we're making some uh, adjustments to it today, uh, is one that uh, I support. And of the 5,000 total units that will be built in Hunters Point South, uh, Sixty percent uh, are affordable. The first 924 units are already uh, open and uh, occupied, and we'll be hearing obviously from folks who will be part of the subsequent 4,000 units. But uh, these new schools are incredibly important to our community, and uh, I am uh, uh, supportive of the changes that are being made to it today uh, and will be as a result of a positive action in the council. So with that, I thank uh, our chair and our acting chair, Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, LU 221 Hunter Point South is related to property 5203, Center Boulevard, Block 6, Lot 60, also known as Parcel C to the North Tower in the Long Island City neighborhood of Queens. HPD 6 approval of the new Article 5 tax exemption for a period of 40 years pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The project will consist of one residential building totaling 855,541 square feet with 8,071 square feet of commercial space. The project will provide rental housing for low-income families receiving UDAAP approval in 2008, amended UDAAP approval is being requested on the LU-222 to reflect the addition of two new schools to an overall Hunter Points South plan. LU-222 is an application to modify the project that was previously approved in 2008, pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law, HPD 6, UDAAP designations, designations for property located at 2nd Street, 54-02 uh, 2nd Street, and 5250 2nd Street, Block 6. Lots 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 130, 160, and 165 Long Island City neighborhood of Queens in order to accommodate the inclusion of new schools to the project. The lower AMIs for residents under the proposed project, the city will still sell the disposition areas for the construction of approximately 16 buildings containing a total of approximately 4,076 units. 
However, under this approval, approximately 2,446 units will be rented or sold to households with incomes ranging from up to 30% of AMI to up to 165% of AMI and approximately 1,630 units will be rented or sold at market rate prices. Additionally, sponsors will construct approximately 109,824 square feet of retail space, approximately 45,000 square feet of community facility space, and accessory parking on the disposition area and develop uh, portions of disposition area as public and private open spaces. The School Construction Authority will develop two approximately 80,000 square foot schools on the disposition area. I now open the public hearing on the Hunter Point South and would like to invite HPD to present its testimony. Um, can you please come up, HPD? I'm going to ask uh, council to administer the oath to HPD. Just a sec. We have and um, we have the applicants. Here? Of, yeah, we have a couple of people from the development team. Okay, sure. Let them like step to up. up too. Okay, thanks. Um, before answering, um, please state your name. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Derek Marcus, I do. Lacey Tauber, yes. John McMillan, no, yes. I have a reaction to a medical test, though. You may be good. What? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'll speak louder. Okay. Um, land use items number 221 and 222 consist of a proposed amendment to the Hunters Point South Project, a multi-phase initiative in Queens Council District 26. On November 13, 2008, City Council approved the Hunters Point South Project, which included approximately 5,000 units, approximately 126,500 square feet of retail space, approximately 45,000 square feet of community facility space, one 180,000 square foot middle school slash high school, and 10 acres of public parkland, as well as other public and private open spaces. The project also included new public streets and utilities. The project was envisioned as a middle income housing project with income targets above 80% AMI. It was to include 60% permanently affordable housing units at moderate and middle incomes and 40% market rate units. The housing developments were to pay for the operations and maintenance of the 10 acre park, including public restrooms and a kayak launch. Since the 2008 approvals, approximately 16,676 square feet of commercial space has been created. Additionally, construction of 924 units on parcels A and B was completed in 2015. Parcel B also contains an 1,100-seat school that was completed in 2013. Furthermore, 10 acres of public parkland com um, completed construction in two phases, one in 2013 and the other in 2018. Other the under the proposed amendment for the Hunters Point South project, the project has been updated to include two new public schools in response to the local community and to include deeper affordability than was planned previously. One or more sponsors will acquire disposition areas for $1 per tax slot, and each sponsor will deliver an enforcement note and mortgage for the remainder of the appraised value. The sponsors will conduct approximately, uh, sorry, construct approximately 4,076 units, of which approximately 2,446 units will be rented or sold to households with incomes ranging from 30% AMI to up to 165% AMI. The balance will be market rate units, that's 1,630 units, constructed in phases. Additionally, the sponsors will create approximately 109,824 square feet of retail space, approximately 45,000 square feet of community facility space, and accessory parking on the city-owned sites. 
Land use number 222 relates specifically to the, the development of eight vacant city-owned lots slated for the construction of new mixed-use development as just described by a selected developer and two new schools by the school, Contru school construction authority, which will yield 572 seats on parcel C and 612 seats on parcel F. Um, land use 221 is related to a request for an Article 11 tax exemption for the residential building to be constructed on Block 6, Lot 60. Upon conveyance, the residential building will be 55 stories comprised of approximately 800 units with a mixture of unit types, including 174 studios, 145 one-bedroom, and 482 bedroom apartments, plus one two-bedroom apartment for a superintendent. 534 units will be permanently affordable to individuals and or families with incomes of 40%, 50%, 130%, and 165% of AMI, with rents at 37%, 47%, 115%, and 130% AMI. There will be 265 market rate units, one superintendent's unit, and approximately 8,071 square feet of ground floor retail space. HPD is before the subcommittee seeking an amendment to the project and tax benefits under Article 11 in order to facilitate affordability for the housing units to be constructed in the long term. The cumulative value of the tax exemption is a um, possibly a typo. Um, 402 million two hundred fifty-eight thousand three hundred sixteen. Net present value is approximately one hundred twelve million three hundred seventy-nine thousand four hundred and four. Thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer, for your support and for being here today. Um, yeah. Uh, please turn on the mic and uh, please get the correct uh, net present value while Sorry, folks are speaking. A dollar sign there. Hi, I'm John McMillan, Director of Planning for TF Cornerstone. We are a family-owned company originally from Queens. We've been around for 50 years, and we now mostly do large public-private sector projects. This is an example of one of those. I have a board I'd like to show of the project. Um, it's a project that we're doing in partnership with the city, Parcel C, Hunters Point South here. It's a total of 1,200 units. And it's going to be done in two towers, a north tower and a south tower. Um, originally, there was going to be housing throughout the entire site. There was going to be a street wall along Center Boulevard, but we ran into some subterranean issues on the site, and these were problems, and so we felt it was better to move all the housing to the northern and southern end of the site but that created an opportunity to take some time, and we worked with Council Member Van Bramer, and we were able to bring in a, a public school for the site, which you can see in yellow, and a very large outdoor playground. And in the, the remainder of the middle of the site, we're going to be doing public open space, which will be a sort of rotating community-based sculpture garden. Um, for the North Tower, we are in partners, partnership with Self-Help Community Services. They will help us manage and provide services to 100 low-income senior units. And in the South Tower, we will be doing a new facility for Sunnyside Community Services, where they will be providing a new facility for home health care. So if you are sort of taking care of an ailing parent or something, you can come to this center to get help for yourself. Or if you want to become a home health care aide, you can come to a training center here and get certified as a home health care worker. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the, because we had to move the apartments to the north and south extreme ends of the site, these are tall buildings and relatively expensive. So TF Cornerstone is putting in $100 million of its cash equity for the project, as well as um, f foregoing any developer's fee. And this is enabling us to achieve the 66% affordable objective for the project. So in the North Tower, a total of 534 units will be 
mixed income units. These will range in uh, AMIs from 37% to 130%. 60% of the units will be family size two bedroom units. Our sergeant at arms is asking if somebody can assist you with the microphone so that. Oh. Uh, almost done here. 60% will be family size two bedroom units. Um, and then you can see the associated incomes for the apartments down here. One last uh, thing, uh, TF Cornerstone is one of the few remaining union builders in town. Um, all of our projects have been built uh, by union labor. This will be a 32 BJ project as well. We strive very hard to reach out to WMBEs. We've only awarded one contract so far for this project, but it is the concrete superstructure, the largest contract, and that has been awarded to a woman-owned firm. We strive very hard to achieve 25 to 30 percent of minority-based workforce on the project. And we work with the city's uh, New York City Hire project to reach out to the local community to provide job opportunities, both permanent, temporary, and um, job training at the site. Thank you. Any? Uh, do, do you have a, a version of that that can be submitted for the record? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, thank you. I just want to um, uh, highlight a couple of things. Number one, uh, almost 70% affordable uh, on this project. Uh, and um, very pleased uh, that you're uh, working with uh, uh, all of those unions and, uh, uh, and they are part of the project. And, you know, I, I don't want to gloss over, but I, I want to stress how important these schools are to our community, uh, absolutely essential, um, as we have a school seat crisis um, and we are um, absolutely in desperate need of these over 1,000 seats on the combined two projects and uh, also uh, the open space uh, and your partners. I was actually just with Self Help on uh, Saturday uh, uh, right by your site. They were very excited about working together, and of course, Sunnyside Community Services. I'm thrilled to part of the project as well. Uh, maybe John, uh, you could talk a little bit about timing here, because um, that school cannot be built fast enough, and um, we are uh, hopeful that not only uh, this action, but uh, uh, will help expedite uh, your process. But but how are we doing there? Um, our expectation is to close at the end of this year, and we will have a building permit at that point, and we will begin construction immediately. And it's my understanding that the school is lined up to begin construction at the same time, beginning of next year. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, I believe our other school is currently uh, already ahead. Yeah, uh, ahead. underway and in construction, because uh, I go by often and see uh, parcel F, uh, the school and parcel F already under construction. So, um, uh, with that, I just want to say we've uh, worked on this. It is, it is a uh, an adjustment of a plan that's already approved or has been approved. Uh, this uh, proposed action actually makes it a much better project in in several different ways. So, um, uh, that's all I have to say at this point, um, Chair Kalos. Thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer. Uh, thank you for disclosing so very much in your uh, testimony for HPD, as well as thank you for the developer being here. Uh, what is the net present? I'm sorry. What? So, what is the uh, cumulative value on the net on, on the uh, tax exemption? Yeah, it's um, four hundred and two million two hundred and fifty-eight thousand three hundred and sixteen. There was just a four where the dollar sign should be in the testimony. We'll get you a clean copy for the record. Sorry about that. Appreciate. 
Thank you. And when you ran that $402 million, is that from today until 40 years from today, or is that from 2008 until uh, 40 years from 2008? I assume it's from closing in the projection, but we can get we can get back. So that to is that. a closing you project at the end of the this year. It, it wouldn't be from two thousand eight, but we'll get back to it exactly the okay. term. Okay, it's from it's from closing. Okay, yeah, it's from closing. Okay. So I, I figured out a, a way of. Uh, so I guess my. This is your project, and and I'm. In one sense, it is a good thing that you now have an opportunity to add two schools to the site. That is, I, I would, there are very few things I would not do in the world <laughs> to get two schools in my district. Uh, believe you me, the, the, the mayor hears about that from me every single time I see him. Uh, so I, I think that is a net positive, but can you just, yours is part of a, a series of projects I've been seeing from HPD recently uh, that have been stalled. In this case, it appears to have been stalled for 10 years. Uh, if you can share why that is and for HPD, why HPD has not, I, I think for the developer, why did it stall for so long for, and, and why you should continue to be the custodian of this project, then, then to HPD, why this allowed to stall for so long with five of those years being under the watch of this administration? I, I can answer for the, okay. for the developer. Um, j just to clarify, in uh, 2013, we were awarded the RFP. The 2008 date, I think, refers to the um, the, the rezoning um, of Hunters Point South. Um, so shortly after we were uh, designated um, the winner of the RFP, uh, we did uh, preliminary planning work and realized that there are several easements that are beneath the site. Amtrak tunnels, a New York uh, LIPA power line that goes through the site, um, some drainage easements. Um, so it took a long time to work with those easement holders to reconfigure the site um, to allow us to move forward. And for HPD, so that, that, that accounts for, so you're only, only on the hook for five years, but it took five years from purchasing to? They were developing the two sites to the north during those two years. Parcels A and B, and then this yeah. is C. well, and also just the, the five years. I mean, you redesigned the project about four times, right? Um, we had to incorporate a school. Even before, actually, it was made clear that the easements were a problem. We knew about the school, and the school was not part of the original RFP, so that was a design exercise. And then we found out that we can't do any building over the easements fairly late in the process. Um, and that's, that's some of the reasons why. In terms of since 2008, we actually have two buildings that have been constructed, two buildings and the school, so two residential buildings on parcels A and B, and then the school on parcel B. Um, those were all done. Um, the school opened in 2013. The buildings opened in 2015. Also, the 2008 approval covered the park as well, so some of this was HPD's housing project, and some of this was coordinating with EDC on the infrastructure so that all the roads and the park was built out before the buildings came online. I, I've been giving developers a hard time for taking two years, and these are small, nonprofit, affordable housing developers. You are, you are a developer so large that I can see your logo from my house. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't actually have river views, but like your logo is very prominent, and I represent the Upper East Side, so I, I can't look at the waterfront without seeing it. So you're saying, so. A, you got, why did it take five and seven years to get the two parcels done, and what is your estimated timeline for these new approvals? The five years from 2008 to 2013. Um, we can get back to you on specifics, but we, we put out an RFP after ULERP for those two parcels designated, which takes anywhere from nine months to a year, depending on the complexity of the project. Those are very two large buildings. Um, then pre-development and then to closing. Um, you know, we can get back, we can get an exact timeline. I wasn't here at that time, but I, I will get, get you an exact timeline. Then in terms of going forward, uh, we designated two more parcels, F and G. Um, 
and we just did that. Expect to be, we're in pre-development now, we expect to be closing on those parcels soon, uh, hopefully sometime next year. Um, and then we'll release an RFP for the next two parcels probably at the same time, but we haven't determined that yet. They're very large parcels and a lot of, a lot of units, so we might break them up. Um, but we expect to release an RFP next year for the next two parcels. Yeah, it was, it was intended to be a phased project with different developers, different architects. And just in terms of the amount of units and absorption reasons, we can't put 5,000 units on the market all at the same time um, because there is a market rate component here. It, it made sense to phase the project over a long time. And that was part of the original 2008 um, doc, uh, planning. Hey. I would like to hear an answer from TF Cornerstone in terms of what their experience has been. I also can't help but want to jump on why can't we put 5,000 units on the market tomorrow? Like, why is that bad for the market and affordable housing? I, I, that, well, that's not for, for you. That's for HPD. So if I can let HPD answer that question, because I, I imagine that would have a, an effect that HPD might want. Yeah, I mean, we had to build the infrastructure. So there was two phases of infra infrastructure on this project, too. The phase one infrastructure was done in 2014, I believe, when they finished the streets in the phase one project. Phase two, the streets just opened this past year, uh, or this year, 2018. Uh, actually, DOT is still in the process of taking jurisdiction of the streets, um, but they're, they just opened, the park just opened. Um, those streets all had to be all built out before the buildings can be in operation. Um, so again, a reason for phasing. In terms of speaking to why you want, want to put 5,000 units out all at the same time, if they're 100% affordable and they go through a lottery, maybe you can fill them that quickly, but there's a development process that takes time. Uh, it takes time to build a building, get your permits, get your CO, et cetera. Um, and because there's a market rate component here of the project, the market rate component does take time to, to absorb. And you don't want to flood the market with, um, with the same income of units or same rents. It's, they can speak to their experience in Long Island City and Upper East Side as a developer, but it never makes sense to put too many units out on the market all at the same time. I, I would argue that is precisely what HPD should be doing. You have no duty to protect the market rates for your developers, and I, I, I question whether HPD should be supporting developers in withholding market units from the market. I think that is a big deal. I know that uh, council, and, and so I just want to speak globally. I just want to thank Councilmember Van Bramer for his great work on this project. He's gotten a lot for his district, and anyone watching from his district should know. Uh, my questions relate more and are directed at HPD related to just a, a larger threshold that I'm starting to see throughout all the different pieces as a thread, just things taking longer than perhaps they should and us missing opportunities to get 5,000 units on the market at once, which would have a huge impact on the market rates. So I, I uh, uh, appreciate very much um, all the things that you've uh, contributed, uh, Councilmember Kalos, obviously no one has lived through this project more intimately than myself, and uh, we have certainly uh, been unhappy with the delay on the school in particular, and obviously we want uh, as many affordable housing units to come online as possible, but as was referenced, we have a lot of infrastructure challenges in Hunters Point and Long Island City, and I'm not sure the neighborhood uh, uh, could absorb 5,000 units coming online all at once. Um, uh, in many ways, we, we like the phasing out of this because we've got a lot of work to do with this administration to get transportation and other kinds of infrastructure enhancements to be able to absorb those other uh, uh, 4,000 units that are coming online over time. So while the schools can't happen fast enough, and, and that's what we've been pressing for, and part of what's happened here is there wasn't a school initially on this, but we demanded and worked with the administration to get one put into it. And then, of course, they had to change uh, the plans to make sure that we had the school in the project. And, of course, they uh, spoke to some of the 
issues that they ran into uh, uh, underground. And uh, so overall, uh, we're at a place now where uh, this school uh, could be built um, and, and needs to be built because we have a lot of young children in our neighborhood who are gonna be going to that school as soon as it opens up. And of course, this uh, process, sometimes uh, uh, laborious and sometimes very frustrating, has actually improved this project. And what we're looking at today is better than what the council approved in 2008. Uh, and so I see progress there. And that's what's important, I think, to my community. We have the, the park. Um, we just opened a $105 million uh, state-of-the-art waterfront park expansion. That's good. We need that. Uh, uh, this project will actually include a little bit more open space, and I love the uh, rotating sculpture garden feature as the chair of cultural affairs. Um, so th there are good things happening, the good things here. Um, uh, your point's all uh, well taken, but I do think that there are um, uh, some very valid reasons not to want 5,000 units to come online at the same time in this community, because what you see here is a, is a project that uh, precedes several other projects that this administration would like to uh, advance and um, there is just so much we can take all at one time. What has been the experience for uh, TF Cornerstone as these delays have come up through HPD and ease unforeseen easement issues and how could the city be a better partner to you? Um, we had to work through the easement requirements for Amtrak, the Long Island Railroad, and the MTA, all of which have easements under the site. But the killer was a New York power easement. Uh, there's a power line that runs under the site that actually serves Manhattan. It cannot be built over under any circumstances. None of us realized that going into the project. We fought with the power authority for a long time big complicated meetings at city uh, city hall over this we ultimately lost that but a lot of it was you know the battle trying to win the right to build the original plan when we lost those battles we had to reorganize reorganize the site and come up with a different configuration uh, what are your project costs 462 about 460 million Four about 460 million dollars uh, what are your hard costs and what are your soft costs? I'm not, I didn't bring uh, the breakout of the hard and soft costs. Uh, would you provide it on the record? Yeah, sure. We will need that within 72 hours. Uh, so please have that submitted. Uh, In terms of the 100,000 square feet of commercial space, is that going to be one lump sum commercial space? Will that be broken down? How many spaces? And will any of that be at affordable rates or market rates? The, the 100,000 square feet, I believe, relates to the entire Hunters Point South project, parcels A through G. We're providing in this property 8,000 8, square feet of retail and a parking garage that's about 30,000 square feet for 100 spaces. And then in the South Tower, which is not part of um, um, this North Tower development, we're providing a community facility space, and that'll be at below market rents. Uh, you mentioned being committed to certain labor standards. Uh, will those also apply to people operating in the community facility or commercial spaces? And by labor standards, I don't mean union. I just mean whether or not they will have to meet uh, wages that are commensurate with the rest of the neighborhood, whether they'll have health insurance, uh, disability insurance, so on and so forth. For construction, we will be building all of those spaces, so yes. Um, all of the senior units that, that will be part of our building, so that will be 32BJ. Whether or not Sunnyside uses labor to clean their offices, I don't know. I can't answer that. I. I I, I, it, it, it was just in terms of the operation. So I think in one place we, we and so I, I will also ask just for the record. So, so you've, you've mentioned the word uh, union, but that isn't something that is within our purview. So the only thing I can ask you is just 
uh, whether people will be paid a, a wage that is commensurate with the neighborhood, whether or not they will have health insurance, disability insurance, and retirement benefits, and whether that will be available to the construction workers, the service workers in your buildings, as well as people who operate and work within the commercial spaces. I can't speak for our retail tenants or for Sunnyside Community Services, but for us, yes. Great. And you already made reference to the uh, MWBE. One of the other questions that I often ask is just uh, whether or not you as a developer in MWBE or how many executive members of your board or uh, executive level employees identify as a minority or women. We have three executive women, one of whom is Hispanic. And, and uh, out of and how many? The two uh, owners of the company, one, one is an immigrant. There are two brothers, one of whom was an immigrant. Uh, I'm sorry, what was your? Out of how many executives? Six, 40, maybe? Executives? No, not 40 executives. 20? No. Well, I don't know. Under uh, 10. 10. So 30% is, is better <laughs> than 1%. So, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, than 10%. So uh, if you can just share that information. Uh, what sources of fun so you have the Article 11, what are the other sources of funding that you're looking We're putting looking? in 100 million of our cash. The city is lending us 100 million, and we are borrowing 260 million. Uh, from private window or from? It'll be a private construction lender, yes. Uh, are you, rec uh, and the 100 million, is that HPD or HDC or split between both? I believe it's HPD money. Uh, any subsidies over and above the uh, loan? No. No per units. Do you know what term sheet you're using? It's the M squared term sheet. It's M squared, yeah. Okay, so you'll, but you're not planning to take the unit per unit subsidy, just the financing? No, there's, there's subsidy in here as well. Um, did you fill out a card? <laughs> yeah, I, I think did. It was did. This is Ken from HPD <laughs> Finance. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for being here. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> How'd uh, you know? What is the per unit uh, subsidy on the M2 term sheet? Well, it is the, the 100 million that he referenced is what we were calling term sheet subsidy. Um, this is a project that has predated the M2 term sheet. So effectively, we are working on this kind of outside the purview of what is a normal M2 project. That said, for administrative purposes, we have to call it an M2. So, so if you we put insert the uh, the the unique and custom term sheet into the record. Uh, sure, we can do what you like. Okay, and it's a hundred million all in with the financing and the per unit subsidy. Yes. Okay, is there HDD, HDC subsidies on top of this or financing? There is not. Okay. Uh, federal. Anything from the federal government? There is not. Uh, anything from New York State? No. Uh, Low-income housing tax credits? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you have an estimate on how much those will be? Uh, we're, we're planning to retain the credits as the uh, developer. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to get back to you on a, a, a good number there. I am interested in, in how, I, I, not here, but I would be interested. You are the first developer who is planning to retain the, the credits that, that I believe I've seen before this committee. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I would be, how long would that question, t how long would that take to answer? Is that 30 seconds or like 20 minutes? Well, I can give you a condensed answer to your question. Let's go for it. So, so most developers, so how, how do you evaluate whether to, uh, sell or retain? Uh, there, there's lots of factors that go into it. Um, uh, for one, the company, the principals of the company are, are taxpayers, and so they're um, able to take the depreciation and losses associated with the tax credits. Whereas most nonprof most developers are nonprofits or not taxpayers, so therefore they sell it, um, sell the credits to make money or to pay for the development costs rather, um, or and to pay their developers fee. Uh, but here, uh, we've decided that it uh, makes the most sense to keep the tax credits keep the depreciation that goes with it as well. And on this project, what was the original zoning FAR and what is the current zoning FAR? Uh, 
believe it's 10 and, and it's it still it's I don't still 10. believe it changed. Or maybe it's 10 and a half and we can provide that number afterwards. And you have a local hire commitment as uh, part of this project? I think hire NYC maybe local. Yeah, it's, uh, we do that in conjunction with the city's hire and NYC. If uh, Council Member Van Bramer's uh, constituents are watching right now and want to be able to walk to work and help mm -hmm. put up Hunters Point South, uh, who do they call? to get a job? Um, I uh, tried to find the answer to that, and I, my, my best answer is they should Google Hire NYC and go through the, the procedures for applying to the program. Fair. And it's a centralized process that the city's put in place where they reach out to the local communities and gather these names. Our contractors are then forced to call Hire NYC to use those names when they need sort of temporary or permanent employment. Uh, but if, if so that, that is a, a fair enough answer, but I, I'm concerned that that is slightly bureaucratic. And the preference is if uh, developers such as yourself are able to have a person who's designated to receive outreach from the community and work people through the process so that they can be walked through dealing with the bureaucracy that may or may not be higher NYC sure. and then find their way back to your project for their local job. Sure, we can do that. And so you would you like to share a number or would you like to just submit into the record later? Let us submit it to the record, please. Okay. And I think the only other question that I, I have remaining is just a turn on how to quantify the, the delay, as it were. Uh, you've provided the uh, cumulative and net present value of the Article 11 moving forward. I'm under the belief that this project has not been paying, been paying taxes uh, since 18 or 13. So I guess just who's had custody of the site and have there been deferred taxes that have not been uh, used as it were. Uh, it's it's city-owned property. We purchased the property from um, Port Authority in the state um, before 2008, actually. I can't remember what year it was. Okay, so it's, um, it's not so on it's this project, but no, on other owned. projects moving forward, I will ask you what the valuation of the lost taxes are when we did not necessarily get affordable housing. That's. Uh, we may forward additional questions that we may have, but I want to thank you. Councilman Brammer for attending, for his leadership on this, for what sounds like a very daunting process. Uh, I, I can't imagine having to deal with the power authority, and uh, I, I will thank you for Ravenswood and all the other items that, all the other power that is being generated for our city and your district. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members of the public or subcommittee? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearings on land use items 221 and 222, and the application will be laid over. Uh, I would like to now recognize that we've been joined by uh, Council Member Bill Perkins, who would like to speak to uh, previous land use Item 223, 224, and 225. Council Member Perkins. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I have um, a statement that I want to read into the record. Uh, I write this letter to support the tax exemption of Block 1824, Lot 16, AKA 95. Lennox Avenue, also known as Malcolm X Boulevard, a 160-unit Section 8 building, the modification of the plan and the project and the conveyance approval for Block 1824, Lot 155, to LM Development Partners. I support the redevelopment plans as represented in the attached commitment letter, which aims to, one, preserve 160 units of Section 8 affordable housing at Canaan 4, Number two, develop a mixed income 288 unit building with 10% of units income restricted at 50% AMI, 10% of units at 90% AMI, and 20% of units at 130% AMI. 
Number three, develop a 210-unit affordable building with 20% of units at 80% AMI, 20% of units at 70% AMI, 20% of units at 50% AMI, 20% of units at 40% AMI, 10% units at 30% AMI, and 10% of the units set aside for formerly homeless families. As a part of this development effort, LM and HPD will submit a follow up application to rezone lots 16, 19, 20, 21, 155, as well as disposition of approval for city owned lots 19, 20, and 21. Although I would like to see deeper affordability in the entire development, I recognize the efforts of those who have come to, to the table to provide and preserve housing in my district. I therefore give my support to this development effort, including the three items currently before the council, 201-95047 conveyance approval, 201-95048 modification of the previous plan and project, and 201-95049, Article 11, approval. Tax exemptions on Lot 16, as well as the future rezoning and disposition of city-owned property for Lots 19, 20, and 21. Therefore, I support these efforts that will preserve Section 8 housing, create 100% income-restricted building with Ella term sheet, and ensure that Harlem continues to be a neighborhood where people of diverse incomes and backgrounds can thrive. Sincerely, Bill Perkins, Council Member, 9th District. I vote aye. Thank you. I will now open a public hearing on Hopkins Park Place and would like to invite HP to present its testimony. And I want to thank uh, Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel for uh, joining us. And uh, while we are waiting for folks to be seated, uh, our third hearing today is for land use item 233, Hopkins Park Place. Land use item 233 is an application to modify a project that was previously approved in 2009 for a UDAP designation and disposition pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law for property located at 1612 Park Place, Block 1468, Lot 56, and 416 <laughs> Thomas Boyland Street block 1468, lot 63, in the Brownsville neighborhood in Brooklyn. This project is part of HPD's new infill home ownership opportunities program, which promotes new construction of one to three family homes. Small buildings with condominium and cooperative units provide affordable home ownership opportunities. The sponsor of this project is Habitat for the Humanity, Latent Thomas Boylan Street Housing Development Corporation is it's constructing up to three buildings containing approximately 25 cooperative units for sale affordable to families with annual household incomes between 80 percent and 130 percent of AMI. Specifically, HPD is seeking approval to amend the approved 2009 project summary to allow HPD to place the entire HPD land debt construction loan in one mortgage secured against a property owned by the cooperative corporation as opposed to allocating such debt among individual cooperative units following completion of construction. I will now ask our council to administer the oath. For Ms. Tover, you're just reminding you you're still under oath. And for the new people joining us, can you please, before answering, state your name. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Um, this is Erica Benson. I do. Elon Peskin, yes. You may be good. Okay, and I would just add that Elon is with us from Habitat, so, and Erica is also from HPD. Okay, 
Uh, land use number 233 consists of an amendment to a project located at 19, 1900 A and B Park Place and 416 Thomas S. Boylan Street in Brooklyn Council District 41, known as Hopkinson Park Place. The ULARP approval for the Hopkinson Park Place project originally occurred on December 1, 2009, allowing for the area designation, disposition of city-owned property, and project approval for new construction of 25 homeownership units without tax benefits under the new foundations program. However, the project did not advance beyond award to the selected development team because of the downturn in the housing market. Over time, as the housing market began to rebound, HPD began looking at other ways to bring former new foundation projects online, and one strategy HPD is utilizing for this is the new Infill Home Ownership Opportunities Program, or NIHOP. On February 10, 2017, HPD conveyed the site to the development team to build a 25-unit condominium, construction of which is now approximately 65% complete. Subsequent to the conveyance, an amended mayoral authorization was approved on June 21, 2017, converting the project from a condominium to a cooperative. The City Council also granted a 40-year Article 11 tax exemption on February 15, 2018, in order to assist with affordability for the potential cooperative home buyers. At that time, the agency did not realize that the project summary also required a revision because it contains language relative to the 2009 approval stating that the land debt and city subsidy should be allotted to each homeowner. Therefore, as a result of the oversight, HPD is currently seeking to amend the project summary to change those terms. More specifically, the change will allow HPD to maintain city subsidy and land debt as debt secured by the HGFC cooperative's property rather than allocating such debt among individual cooperative units following completion of construction. In addition, the change will permit HPD to forgive all or a portion of the land debt upon the conversion of the HPD construction loan to the HPD permanent loan based on the appraised value of the cooperative units and or if HPD determines that the forgiveness is necessary to reduce the taxable consideration for the cooperative units. These changes provide the agency with the flexibility to reduce the land debt if we find that purchasers cannot obtain end loan financing because the underlying co-op debt is too high. Other aspects of the project remain the same. The sponsor for the project is Habitat for Humanity, Leighton Thomas Boylan Street, HGFC. The project entails the creation of three four-story buildings with a mixture of unit types, including seven one-bedroom, 15 two-bedroom, and three three-bedroom apartments for a total of 25 co-ops. The sales prices are anticipated to range from approximately $212,015 to $250,522. An Article 11 tax exemption was obtained on February 15, 2018, and will remain in place for a term of 40 years, coinciding with the regulatory agreement. Owner occupancy is required throughout the regulatory period, and resale restrictions include the original price plus 2% compounding appreciation for every year of compliance with the HPD regulatory agreement. In order to facilitate moving the project forward, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking the approval of the amended project. Do we have testimony from Habitat? They're just here to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, over to Council Member Ampre Samuel. Good afternoon. I just want to state that everyone knows that I am 100% supportive of this project in my district. I am very excited about the opportunity for home ownership, and the community is very excited. And we worked um, very closely with Habitat for Humanity on the outreach and doing informational sessions in the district. And so we look forward to, um, to the day when the apartments are compl completed and um, ribbon cuttings and everything else. But I just wanna ensure that this process is fair and that it makes sense and that in the end of the regulatory period, it's not an opportunity for the city to step in and um, take ownership of it, but it actually remains um, in the co-op. And so um, that's um, one of the reasons why I have just some questions about just getting some clarity um, related to uh, the purpose of the amendment. And in particular, we did speak outside and we spoke on um, the phone yesterday. I had questions about HPD's um, request to forego the forgiveness section. And, um, and can you just kind of um, speak on the record as to what that looks like in the end? Yeah. And what you're trying to prevent. Um, so this, uh, in that instance, what we're really saying is that um, the debt 
will go away at the end of 40 years. However, if the co-op is, uh, is not in compliance with the regulatory agreement, then HPD can uh, require payment on the enforcement debt. Does it okay. just speak a little closer oh. to the mic? Do I need to re yes, restate that? Restate okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, what we're saying here is that um, the debt is written as forgivable debt. So at the end of 40 years, it will um, it will be forgiven. It will go away. Like the other NIHOP programs, yes. after yes. the regulatory period is expired, yes. then the debt is forgiven. Yes. Right. Um, but all we're saying is, if um, the cooperative is not in compliance with the regulatory agreement, um, HPD can uh, require payment on the enforcement. So debt. can you give me an example of that? Because mm -hmm. um, in the language that I read, mm -hmm. and if you can explain that as well, um, it says if the co-op is not in compliance in all or in part, mm -hmm. and so um, it, the, the period is 40 years. Yeah. So can you speak a little to what that would look like and the enforcement piece of it? Um, so in, in this case, we're um, <laughs> saying that, um, say that there's one co-op board that was in existence or, um, for 10 years, and during those 10 years, they were not monitoring sales or they were allowing multiple sales that were no longer affordable, um, and um, they were able to effectuate those sales uh, despite uh, the regulatory agreement, then we could require repayment or in lieu of repayment an extension of the regular regulatory agreement for that period of non-compliance only. Um, so if there are enforcement mechanisms in place to, to address those situations, is there a need to add this language? We imagine that this is um, purely theoretical, I would say. We don't imagine that um, this will happen, but um, in the event that despite the regulatory agreement um, and the other mechanisms that are in place, the co-op is able to move forward with sales that are not in compliance, um, we would still need the enforcement tool as a way to ensure that the co-op comes back into compliance and continues to provide affordable housing for the community. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure that we have language in place that would in the end actually protect the um, the owners of the units because it just, I don't want it to turn into a situation where um, there's one bad actor in a building and you have all these great tools and, 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 and enforcement mechanisms in place, but um, they're not necessarily enforced. But because the language speaks to the opportunity to not forgive and you just go um, based on what's black and white and the entire building um, is taken over by HPD and you know the other homeowners lose out. And so um, that's what I'm trying to prevent. And so I wanna make sure that the language that, that's, um, that we vote on um, just protect the owners because it just, it's a little confusing with the language that I'm reading. Um, so um, I can say that HPD, if it's if it's one unit that wasn't in compliance, um, this language is not written imagining that scenario. There are other mechanisms in the regulatory agreement that can be used to deal with one shareholder who's um, trying to violate the terms of the regulatory agreement. This is more in the case that um, a co-op in multiple instances across a uh, time period is shown to be um, violating the spirit of the regulatory agreement. Um, I can read the exact language in the project summary into the record if that would help clarify um, okay. what we're saying. Um, that would help. And let me just, and, and I just want to read just um, so you can understand my level of, of um, confusion. This is what I received as an interpretation from HPD staff. And it says, under the NIHA program, any HPD land debt or construction subsidy will be forgiven at the end of the regulatory period. However, 
HPD is requesting the right to forego the forgiveness of either or both of the HPD land debt and construction subsidy in the event that the cooperative corporation has not complied with HPD regulatory terms during all, all or a portion of the regulatory period. So this was a red flag for me. And so if you can just read the actual language so that I can know that this is, that this interpretation was incorrect. Okay. Um, so in the project summary, we're saying the sum evidenced by the notes, note or notes and secured by the mortgage or mortgages will be reduced to zero upon maturity of the land debt and city subsidy respectively if the HDFC cooperative has complied with the regulatory agreement. Okay, and that would be left up to interpretation. Well, um, the regulatory agreement does have pretty clear terms about um, what the cooperative is required to do to be in compliance. Um, and again, that there, there are mechanisms in place for the cooperative if it's just one unit that is violating the terms of the regulatory agreement. Um, so we would not um, require payment on the enforcement note if we are talking about one shareholder. And that's, that already exists? Yes, the regulatory okay. agreement um, does exist. We have a template, HPD regulatory agreement, and it is, um, the terms are the same across HPD cooperatives. Uh, just uh, if, if Council Member Amprey Samuel will uh, give me a, a moment to just jump in. We voted earlier last month on taking cooperatives away from residents who had been working as part of their HDFCs uh, towards home ownership uh, through a third party transfer program. We've also taken other cooperatives away from tenants and trying to work through this regulatory system can be quite a difficult task, and I think uh, Councilmember Ramfrey Samuel is rightly concerned that there is any discrepancy that allows for a, a mispayment here or there, or in so many of these cases, it's getting 18 different tax bills for 18 different lots and just people really doing their best, but not having the level of sophistication tax attorneys might have. So can it be can the language that you just read be amended and clarified to just state that as as that the people will get their ownership interest and uh, that there are so many other tools that you have out there over and above this language to uh, try to help out the building if they're having any trouble? I mean, I think I think I think the point is that this provision is in place for you know, what I think we would consider a worst case scenario and that the the goal of it is to try to ensure that they're complying with the regulatory agreement and keeping the units affordable. Um, but we can get you some more details on the legal interpretation of, you know, how, why we feel comfortable saying that. Um, yeah, we can we can take this back and get some clarification on that. And, and HPD would be willing to submit either a, a legal opinion letter or memorandum of law, either from HPD's counsel or from the law department to just alleviate uh, my colleagues' fears? We'll have to get back to you on what it'll look like exactly. Okay. Okay. All right. So I look forward to working with your office on that language um, because just um, just over recent weeks, we've just had some concerns. I just want to make sure that the residents in the 41st are protected. So yeah, understood. I look forward to it. I think we can get this clarified. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to our partnership. Um, I, I only have a small portion of the affordable housing. Uh, market before this committee, uh, while well, you have <laughs> the the larger portion of our public housing, uh, so uh, we will continue to work together. I, I think first and foremost, will 
I, I was disappointed that Jimmy Carter did not come to testify today. Uh, will Will former President Jimmy Carter be involved in this project in any way? Will he come help in construction or be there for the uh, ribbon cutting? This 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 is a a condition to this possible this this is a possible condition to passing. If President Carter would grace us with his presence on any day for any reason, we will be sure to find a position for him at this project. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, a lot of the questions that I may have here are not necessarily for, for Habitat uh, or not. So when did Habitat end up getting this project? Was it in 2009 or more recently? My understanding is that Habitat became involved in the project in, a, in early 2015 uh, when we were introduced to the uh, party that submitted the RFP who was a co-developer and the architect for the project. And I guess why did it, so my question for you is just once you came in, is it the regular circumstance for it to take three years, or how often? What is your usual timeline, and why did this, why did it take longer for you? So we we got involved in twenty early twenty fifteen, and we closed on the acquisition and the construction financing in early twenty seventeen. So two years is is about a uh, typical pre-development phase for a home ownership project. Some of the, the main challenge that we find in pre-development is securing the financing uh, for the project, um, and especially in a deeply affordable project like this one. And when you got to it in 2015, it was already 65% complete? No, it was uh, HPD still owned the land at that point. The building was only in its early stages of design. We were coming into the project almost from scratch. Okay, and so it's already 65% complete. How soon will it be done? Scheduled completion is uh, February 2019. That's fast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh, when will the units go on the market? Are they currently being marketed? They, the marketing period has been closed. Uh, it was marketed um, between late June and late August, and we are in the process of uh, conducting the lottery with HPD. Can and I add a point of clarification on that, actually? Because um, I think in your testimony you mentioned AMI levels, um, but I wanted to clarify that actually this project, because of Habitat's um, Participation has uh, the ability to offer a, uh, a mortgage product for first-time home buyers um, that allows us to market this project for AMIs between 55 and 58 percent AMI, which I think is slightly different from uh, what your testimony had said. I appreciate the correction. We we use the information that you give us, but that is that is welcome news. Uh, so the. Uh, the prior hearing that we had involved a developer, the a project that taken about 10 years, uh, this one is on, on the nine-year track. Uh, so you just showed up, you're almost done, that's impressive. So HPD, uh, we had over a thousand units come through, over 30 third-party transfer units, and I was concerned that projects might stall, and that when they stall without a need to come back to the council, you won't. And not to put words in your mouth, you can feel free to uh, correct me if I'm wrong, HPD insisted that it was too difficult to come back to the council. So on this item, you had a hearing in December 2009. Uh, another one in 2017 in February, another one in June 2017, and another one in February. So, so that's about four hearings in uh, a little over a year. Uh, how difficult it is, is it for HPD to come before the city council for an approval on affordable housing projects to keep them on track? Well, this is, um, you know, a, a pretty, uh, this is a small change to this project. Um, you know, all we're really doing here is amending the project summary. It's not a huge uh, output of resources for us to do a thing like this as opposed to 
uh, you know, coming back multiple times um, and digging into the program of every project. I think, you know, our uh, our development team likes to say every project is a special flower. So I feel like it's hard to compare this to that. Um, and, you know, we... Uh, we admit that this one, the reason we're back here, was because of an error that we made and not realizing that the project summary uh, should have been updated uh, with this information in the first place. And, you know, we're coming back to you because we have to, because we want to make sure that the residents in this building um, have the best uh, affordability that they can get. If HPD had to come back after the initial transfer, uh, after the initial closing, and you had two years to get in the ground uh, in order to keep the Article 11. Could, could we add that in to say that when HPD gives an Article 11 or, or some other, or even UDAP, that whoever gets it has to get into the ground within two years? And then after that two-year mark, they get another two to three years to finish the project. Not that Habitat needed it because they went really quick. But, like, could we have steps so that we don't get stuck with somebody holding it? It sounds like this co-developer was – and the co-developer, are they here? No, they, they couldn't be here today. They're a small architecture firm, uh, and it's fair to say that they're a silent partner on the project. So, so moving forward, HPD, you are on notice when there are two developers and one of them is the most sympathetic developer in the world. <laughs> uh, and there's a co-developer who had the project for six years without mm -hmm. anything happening. Uh, I would like to see both of them or all of them. It doesn't need to be every single partner, but a representative from whomever so we can get into what went wrong. Uh, but, but so, yes, uh, back to the Question. Understood. Could, could, we do, could we do um, two I mean, years and two we're years? We're not going to be committing to that right now. I will say that this project is a good example of why committing to something like that might be an issue because when this project got its initial approvals, I don't think anybody knew that you know the financial crisis was about to happen and that um, you know building home ownership in the city was going to become a challenge. Um, right after that and part of the reason for the stall was you know the conditions in the housing market and you know now that things are back on track where you're seeing that we're bringing a lot of these projects back to you and we're able to offer you know different kinds of new and exciting things like this mortgage product that Habitat is bringing to the table um, yeah and it's a better project in the end Thank you very much for your uh, testimony on this. I want to thank uh, my colleague for her advocacy. We, we need the answer. We need to make sure that these tenants have certainty. If and, and, and just to be clear, this is the best way that we can support affordable housing and make sure that the tenants have uh, ultimately get to have home ownership because there's just so many instances of HPD properties where people buy in and then years down the line be end up in a rental situation losing all the equity that they invested. So this is about protecting people and making sure that they actually get the affordable housing that, that was promised. Uh, do we have any other members of the public who are here to testify on this item? Uh, if you could on, the, on this item, uh, I. It, I understand that when a co-op is, is sold below market for affordable housing purposes, can the person just turn it around and sell it at market the next day? Uh, no. Um, there is the regulatory agreement in place that has certain restrictions on resale price and incomes for new purchasers. Um, and again, in the event that that regulatory agreement is violated, um, HPD does have the enforcement debt. If somebody tries to sell in year one, how much money do they have to pay back to the co-op? 
they don't have to pay back money to the co-op. They just have to sell at the price stipulated by the regulatory agreement. And if they sell at year 10? It's the same. The price goes up for each year of owner occupancy, but you don't pay any money to the co-op or HPD. You just pay the price that is stipulated in the regulatory agreement. And so then the, the owner cannot make any profit? They do. Or it's very limited? They make uh, some appreciation, and then they make the equity that they built up through paying off their shareholder. And at what point can they sell it at market? Um, at the end of for the 40-year regulatory period. So at year 39, if they sell it, it is at the regulatory rate to somebody of restricted income? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Seeing no one from the community. To testify on this item, I will now close the public hearing on land use item 233 and the application will be uh, laid over. The record will remain open for 72 hours. Our next hearing is land use item 234 for a project site at 21 Arden Street in the Inwood section of Manhattan pursuant to HPD's Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program where occupied city owned residential buildings are purchased by Restoring Communities Housing Development Fund Corporation and then rehabilitated by a private developer. This building will be rehabilitated and conveyed to the current tenants. HPD is seeking approval of an urban development action area project related to actions pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and approval of 40 year Real property tax exemption pursuant to Section 577 of Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The building entered into city ownership through an in-rem foreclosure in 1991, has been uh, participating in the tenant's interim lease, uh, the TIL program, since 2004. The building has 12 occupied units and three vacant units. Once the rehab work is complete, the building will be conveyed to Cooperative HDFC, formed by the building's tenants, cooperative interest to occupied Apartments will be sold to existing tenants for $2,500 per unit, and vacant apartments will be sold for a price affordable to families earning no more than 165% of AMI, which I am hoping HPD will correct me on. I'd like to open the public hearing on 21 Arden Street and would like to invite HP to present its testimony. Uh, if folks could state their names for the record, and then I will ask the council to administer the oath. Genevieve Michael, HPD. Uh, Maria Lizardo with Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. Ehi Ua, HPD. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, before you begin, I uh, realized that in my infatuation with President Carter, I uh, forgot to uh, get certain information related to uh, present net present value and other items, so please make sure that such information is submitted for the record. Uh, you may begin on this item. Uh, land use number 234 consists of the proposed disposition of one partially occupied city-owned building, as well as Article 11 tax benefits located at 21 Arden Street, Block 2174, Lot 188 in Manhattan Council District 10. The property entered city ownership through an in-rem foreclosure action in 1991 and has been participating in the tenant interim lease till program since 2004. As a requirement of the till program, tenants form tenant associations to manage their buildings and collect rents under a net lease from the city of New York. Currently, the tenants are ready to move forward with the next steps in cooperative conversion under HPD's Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program, ANCP. As part of ANCP, HPD selects qualified developers to rehabilitate distressed city-owned occupied multifamily buildings managed under the TIL program in order to create affordable cooperatives for low to moderate income households. The buildings will be transferred to Restoring Communities HDFC, an Article 11 nonprofit upon construction loan closing. 
Restoring communities will hold title and oversee the rehabilitation and cooperative conversion that will be undertaken by Northern Manhattan Community Corporation, the developer selected through a request for qualifications, RFQ. The develop developer will sign a site development and management agreement with restoring communities that will be in effect until co-op conversion occurs when title will be transferred to the cooperative. From the date of co-op conversion, the developer will re remain the property manager for at least one year. After the first year, the co-op will have the choice of keeping the developer as their property manager or hiring a new company approved by HPD. 21 Arden contains a total of 15 units, including six one-bedroom units and nine two-bedroom units. Of the 15 units, three units are vacant and there are no commercial spaces associated with the property. The household incomes for the existing tenants range from 10% to 131% AMI, and the co-op interest attributable, attributable to occupied apartments will be sold to the existing tenants for $2,500. Additionally, the maintenance is anticipated to be approximately 47% AMI for existing tenants, which is roughly $944 for a one-bedroom unit to $1,143 for a two-bedroom unit. The cooperative interest attributable to vacant apartments will be sold for a price affordable to families earning no more than 165% of the area meeting income. The building will undergo a substantial rehabilitation. The work will consist of structural joist replacement work, electrical upgrades, and replacement of building systems, including new windows, a new roof, plumbing upgrades, and installation of a new boiler. The scope of work also includes new bathrooms, kitchens, entry doors, masonry work, flooring, mailboxes, hallway upgrades with bi-level lighting, painting, foundation stabilization, and, and asbestos and lead removal. The estimated development cost is approximately $6,686,793. Tenants have been temporarily relocated since 2009 due to structural issues and will remain relocated during the rehabilitation of the building. All relocated tenants have signed relocation agreements, which are legally binding, giving them the right to return to their original units. Any existing tenant requesting to return to a different unit based on physical limitations may be accommodated upon written consent by HPD. HPD is before the subcommittee seeking disposition approval and Article 11 tax benefits for a term of 40 years coinciding with the regulatory agreement in order to facilitate continued affordability of the cooperative. The cumulative value of the tax exemption is approximately $2,886,289 with a net present value of $806,346. Um, I also note that unfortunately Councilmember Rodriguez could not be here today, but we are extremely thankful that he has contributed uh, $200,000 in ResoA funding to support the project. Do you have testimony or are you just qu answering questions? No, just answer questions. Okay. Same. Let's just pause for a moment so we can see if Councilmember Kalos is going to resume return with questions. Thank you. We're going to take a five minute recess.
Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, our, our, our substitute committee counsel uh, for <laughs> stepping in. Uh, at the opening of this hearing, I, I mentioned that I was dealing with uh, some ailments and my doctor was just calling me back. So I just needed to uh, step out and uh, find out that I will continue to feel bad for some time, but I will eventually <laughs> feel better. Uh, but uh, <laughs> if, you, if you think politicians... Uh, <laughs> Medical care could get better. I'm waiting for my tribe quarter. And yes, I am a huge nerd. So I want to thank folks for uh, coming in on this. I am a big fan of the TIL program. Uh, I wanted to just zero in on some key items. Uh, so I guess the uh, first one, which I did not see corrected, is that under your terms, uh, the th there are three vacant units in this building. Is that correct? That's correct. And sorry, just one thing to uh, jump in with. Uh, Christine, who's been point on this, was going to join the hearing today. Unfortunately, during, due to a last minute emergency for her and some timing constraints, she had to leave. So uh, he here has graciously agreed to jump in and I think can adequately fill in for her, but in the event that there are follow-up, we might need to go to Christine. Sure. You have a building with tenants earning as little as $7,000 a year and tenants earning as much as $95,000 it, it, for, for, the, for the single individual, is 95000 a year. If it is a family of six, it could be as much as $157,000. Uh, but, but that's the affordability of that part of this neighborhood. Uh, you're setting the affordable rates at 47% of AMI. And, and so that speaks to me that you believe that so so – Am I right to believe that setting it at 47% of AMI for existing tenants is an indicator that the affordability rate for this building and perhaps even this uh, neighborhood may be 50% of AMI or 47%? So we're setting the, the maintenance at 47% AMI for the insiders and the outsiders. Um, and that's set at that level to pretty much meet the operating cost of the building. Um, we try to make sure that the insider tenants are able to afford as much as they can. Um, you noted that you know some people are making 10% of AMI. For those tenants, we um, aim to secure Section 8 vouchers for them um, so everyone in the building can meet the same maintenance. So 165% of AMI is $120,615 a year with such low income folks in this building and I imagine this surrounding neighborhood, why not limit the new purchasers to the same affordability as the previous building that we saw with, with, with uh, folks and uh, instead of doing it at 165, would, would you be willing to limit it to 50% of AMI because that's what the maintenance is gonna be anyway? Um, are you speaking on the, the sales prices of vacant units or the maintenance amount? I am connecting the two, yeah. and I'm asking why the sales price of vacant units is going to be for people earning 120000 to $199,000 a year. So the sales prices for the vacant units, are they're set at 80% of AMI. So for a one-bedroom, that's 149000 um, roughly. And for a two bedroom, it's 178. Um, Do you, that's around 81% less than the market for a one bedroom and 152% less for the two. I, I like what I'm hearing. Yeah. So can somebody earning $199,000 a year get one of the three vacant units or is it only for people making between 58 and 96,000? Um, yeah, so someone making 199 would not be eligible. Um, there's an income band, um, and we normally set that around 10% higher than what the AMI for the sales for the vacant units are. 
So does, that's correct. Um, would that's would HPD only. like to, to re change its testimony and just reaffirm that it's at 80% of AMI, not 165%? Or does the regulatory agreement allow for more and this is just your current offering? So we can could definitely get back to you and confirm that number, but um, the vacant unit is not set at 165 for these vacant units. Okay. I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah. All the materials we have, including the, the spoken testimony, set 165. So... Yeah, we'll get back to you. Okay. Uh, similarly, along those same lines, there are tenants making seven thousand a year. There are tenants who be, who may be making between ninety five and one hundred fifty seven thousand a year. Uh, why has HPD chosen to set it at forty seven percent of AMI, versus asking those who are making perhaps six figures, actually pretty much six figures, to pay a little more? Um, so because this is a co op, um, maintenance is equalized um, for. Um, all tenants, regardless of how much they make. Uh, what we aim to do, as I mentioned, um, for those tenants who make below the amount that we're setting the maintenance, we um, aim to secure a Section 8 voucher so they can meet that 47% AMI mark. Uh, if, if in your testimony you could also include that, the Section 8 voucher, so you're saying it's aimed, is there a commitment from HPD to provide it? Uh, what we've seen is that we've um, received an allocation for the projects that are going through conversion, and we're hoping to also have that for these tenants once that time does come. What is the, how does, so I am almost sure today, I, I saw Section 8 in previous testimony. How does HPD determine when it's going to offer Section 8 and when it's going to hope to offer Section 8? So as the um, projects near completion, um, there's a rent restructuring that occurs. Um, and at that time, we can offer the applications for tenants to fill out um, for Section 8 vouchers. Um, the allocations, there's not a periodic time period, but we do receive um, frequent allocations. Um, I can't give a set time period for when these allocations are given, but we have received them in the past, and we expect to maintain them in the future. When will the uh, construction begin and when will it complete? So right now we're aiming for a December, December uh, financing um, you know, commitment to begin construction. With that expectation, we'll expect construction to begin sometime in January. Um, and we normally aim for an 18-month construction period. So with that said, the June of 2020 would be the aim for completion. That's, that's a long time. Yes. Um, so with this project, there is a substantial need to rehab the building. There's also some stability concerns with the structure. So with all that considered, it's, it definitely is a lot of rehab work that's needed, and that does take a while. We want to make sure we're doing it correctly. So you know, we definitely do not want it to not take the amount of time that's really required. And I think you're about to be the third person from HPD that I've asked a specific question today. So we have this project. It starts in 1991 when it becomes, uh, when it becomes in REM and, and the city forecloses. It became a till property in 2004. It seems that there was so much work that needed to be done that these tenants had no hope. They were forced out of their home in 2009. Correct. It's been nine years. You people, people have been forced from their homes that they owned under till for nine years. That's, that's a long time. What happened? 
It's definitely a long time. Um, so, as mentioned, I know it was mentioned in previous testimonies that, you know, there was the economic downturn. Home ownership was not as viable a financial option for the city to fund at that time. So there was a halt in till development at that time. Um, in 2012, the ANCP program was created. Um, 21 Arden was one of the first projects that was assigned, was assigned to NIMIC um, soon after. We tried different methods of trying to make this a more financially viable project. We wanted to pair this with other buildings. Um, for one reason or another, um, these other buildings did not work out. And, you know, at this time we're coming here because we understand this building has been out of their homes for um, nine years, as you mentioned, and, you know. So soon to be 11. Soon to be 11. Um, it's a very expensive project, but we understand that, you know, with that amount of time out of their buildings, this building does need the renovation and these um, tenants do need to return home. I, I admire your commitment to the right of return. What are the sources of funding for the $6.7 .6, million project? So the city is um, providing a substantial amount. Uh, we're also getting specific private- Specific agencies, specific programs. HPD. So HPD is providing $4.6 million for this project. Um, In loans or subsidies? A city subsidy. Okay. As was mentioned, the council member, Udonis Rodriguez, has allocated uh, $200,000 in Res OA funding. Okay. And there's a private um, loan from a bank totaling at $762,000. I'll take your word for it. I'm not seeing the 200000 from Rodriguez in the testimony. I added it, and at the end, it wasn't in the official. But it was in the it was in all of the information that was sent over to you guys. Okay, thank you for adding it to the oral. I, I full disclosure, I rely pretty heavily on this because it's a lot of numbers to to chew. And then there's seven hundred thousand that you mentioned. Yes, and that's from a private lender. At seven hundred sixty-two, um, three hundred twenty-four dollars. Okay, that that does not get me to six point seven million dollars. Okay, um, so there is also uh, AHC funding of $530,000. What does AHC stand for? That's the Affordable Housing Corporation. That's a state grant that um, is applied for by restoring communities, um, and we've already secured that amount of money for this project. And how much was it again, sir? 530000 And also we have the, the sales proceeds. Um, it's thirty thousand dollars for the occupied units, and it's four hundred seventy-six nine hundred seventy-four thousand for the vacancies. I think we're still short three hundred thousand. Those, I, it's adding up to me. On your sheet, it adds up. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Uh, I, I may have not accounted for the 30s and the 60s and what have you, so yeah. I, I will take your word for it. Uh, it, it to the extent you can share that. I've, Definitely. So I guess the, the larger question, uh, because I'm always going somewhere with my questions, is just it seems in 2009 the only money that wouldn't have necessarily been there would have been about $900,000 from the – uh, 760 from private, 200,000 from the council member. I guess one question I have for HPD overall is, for at least two items today, you've said there was an economic downturn. How was HPD impacted by the economic downturn? And 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 granted, ANCP didn't exist until 2012, but to what extent? Did, did HPD stop issuing subsidies and loans during the economic downturn, or to what extent can the economic downturn truly be blamed for this? Um, I can say that for our program, there was a there was another till hearing last year um, in the same building. Um, based on the outcome of that hearing, the city increased its term sheet limit for this program to ensure that more till buildings could be renovated. Um, 
I can speak for our, but I cannot speak for exactly what happened in 2009. What was the change in the term sheet? Uh, it went from 100,000 um, per DU to 200,000. As you can see, this um, project is a lot more expensive than that. Um, and a lot of that, a lot of our commitment to this project is due to the fact that these tenants have been out of the building for nine years now. And as you mentioned, it will be 11 years by the time construction is done. Okay. Uh, what additional subsidies did you roll into the uh, number? Because at 200000 per DU, there's... Yeah. Uh, so there's only 15 units, so that only comes out to three million. And we've went um, way beyond our term sheet limit for this project because of the, you know, the concerns that tenants have been out of this building for a long time, and just the construction needs of this building at this time. So you added another 150. Correct, approximately. Okay. Uh, these are the tough questions that uh, were not answered in the testimony as with previous developers. So uh, this is just about how this is being uh, developed. So just in terms of the work that's being done, will the people doing the work and maintaining the building, will they get paid a, will they be able to afford to live in this building? Will they get paid enough? Will they get paid a commensurate wage? If they get injured by the job on the job, can they get health insurance? Uh, if they uh, can't go back to work, will they have disability insurance? Will they be able to retire? Will they have a, a retirement uh, that they can rely on? Um, we're the nonprofit partner working with uh, Lemley and Wolf, who is actually uh, doing the construction work. So we'll get back to you with all the details when it comes to the employment pieces. W we, would you agree we, that these are important values? Of course they are, and that's what we want as an organization, to make sure that happens. Great. And uh, with regards to uh, the, the, develop, the, the contractor, are, are they or any of the other providers MWBEs? Uh, we'll get back to you with specifics on that, because we uh, do our best to make sure that we have MWBEs available. The architect. The architect. Uh, MWBE. Mm -hmm. And with regards to uh, your organization, uh, are you an MWBE, or if you're not able to qualify based on your status, uh, what is the makeup of your uh, board or executive level employees? In terms of we're a nonprofit, so we're not able to be certified. Uh, I am the executive director, and about 60% of our leadership team is people of color, and our board is primarily comprised of people of color. Uh, in terms of... Uh, Local hire, are you planning to hire people from the community to work on this project? We will work with Lemley and Wolf to ensure that we get the information out on the uh, availability of work on the project. If somebody is watching at home and uh, they may be walking past 21 Arden, where, who do they call, who do they reach out to to get a job on this site? Uh, we'll make sure to have an appropriate number to call for that. We also run an employment program, so we're also trying to see how we can get some of our uh, clients in there as well. Okay, uh, to the extent that you might be here again, please have all these answers uh, in, in the future. Uh, I think those, oh, um, sorry, I, and I'm sorry for not asking if, if we can get answers on the previous applications. Uh, will th I know that this is a small building with only 15 units. Mm -hmm. I am imagining that the folks are a lot older now than they were before. Yes. And at the rates of income, I'm going to also guess that many of them may be on fixed incomes. Mm -hmm. uh, what types of accessibility are being planned? And uh, while HPD is at the table, how much would it cost you to make the entrance accessible or to make additional floors accessible? And how many tenants are you dealing with that have uh, mobility-related disabilities? So, so the I exact wanted her to answer. <laughs> it's fine. The, the exact number of tenants uh, that require accessibility needs, I would not have that. But um, I think, as mentioned, we do provide 
um, tenants with the opportunity if they do need a lower floor to provide documentation to us and you know we try to accommodate as best we can if there is an available unit on a lower floor for them okay back back over to uh northern manhattan um one one person has requested needs um one person right jennifer yeah, he lives on the first floor now. So in terms of the tenants, yes, you're right. They are getting older. We have a tenant who's here with us today, um, Miriam, right here, who has uh, been leading the tenants and the tenant association and holding them together to make sure that this project got done. So I guess, does the building have a stoop or? A ramp in the front. Can you? A ramp in the front. We will so there will be a ramp. So the mm -hmm. first floor will have how many units? Three. Three units on the first floor that will all be accessible via the ramp. Yes. And then the remaining five stories, sorry, the remaining four stories will not be accessible? It's a walk up. Okay. It's a walk up. And is there any ability to add? No, there's no ability to add an elevator. Okay. Uh, if you're interested, I'd be interested in working with you. I imagine this is a gut rehab? Mm hmm. Okay. Do you mind uh, stating for the record? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is there is there opportunity? I don't know where you are in terms of architectural or design, but uh, to try to do so, uh, I, I'm very interested in taking on this specific challenge of how do we find space, whether it's relaxing rear yard requirements or is this an old an old style tenement building or yes, it is. Uh, how how wide is your air shaft? There's no, air shaft. There's no yeah, there's no. You don't, you don't have, mm -hmm. sorry, the person in the audience. Oh, uh, so. I, I, know, I, I know that the, we have exhausted every option when it came to um, expanding space. It's a small building. Mm -hmm. And so there isn't an opportunity to add an elevator. To, to the extent you're interested, if I could wave a magic wand. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in, in my district, uh, hospi uh, a lot of the hospitals get BSA variances to do whatever they want. Uh, and even uh, small educational institutions that charge $60,000 a year uh, and have endowments of uh, $100 million get variances uh, to do things. And I, I would find making your building accessible to its tenants to be equally, if not more so, uh, the, uh, valuable as uh, deserving of a variant. So I'd just be interested if you have any ideas of how you would do it structurally. Uh, it's more just learning. It doesn't need to be for the 72 hour period. That would be helpful. Uh, if there's any additional questions, we will uh, submit them. And uh, just uh, in, in the additional submission, if you could share what the cost has been for the time without uh, what, what the net present value and cumulative value is for the tax abatements that were not paid while this property has been vacant. Uh, I would like to figure out what the, if I can put a number on it, what is the cost of leaving these buildings vacant to the taxpayers? And I, I think just my, my last, last, last is how does somebody apply for some of these vacant units? So uh, once construction is complete, the vacant units would be, will be advertised on HPD's website. And what address would that be on? That would be, uh, be Housing mm -hmm. Connect <laughs> NYC, I believe, or? My understanding is these don't go through Housing Connect, but they are advertised on HPD's website, which I believe is hpd.nyc.gov. <laughs> We also advertise because we want to make sure that as many people from the community have an opportunity to apply. So NEMIC is committed to doing outreach in the community when these are available. It is not Housing Connect at NYC. If you Google Housing Connect, it will come up because the URL is not easy to find. Uh, Sorry, just, just to clarify, these units do not go through Housing Connect. I definitely wrote a law on this, and it should. We would, uh, I, I already sent an email about this uh, the other day, so we'll sit down and go over it. Uh, not related to this specific project, but I believe that all New Yorkers should be able to just go to one site to apply to all the affordable housing, uh, instead of having to go to a site for HPDs on Housing Connect, having to go to HPD's website to, where would it even be on HPD's website? 
I, I mean, I think we do the home ownership different and separate from Housing Connect, but I can actually get back to you with that information. Okay. I'm just on your website and I'm just trying to find home ownership and there's not even a link on the front page. So we will we will dig into this deeper, but I'm I'm almost certain that a law I wrote last year will uh, would, would require this to be included. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone from the public who wishes to testify? Uh, seeing none, I will close this hearing on this item and uh, we will now go to the next item on the agenda. Our next hearing will be on four applications, land use items 226, 227, 228, and 229, Sunset Parks 1 through 4, that we will hear together related to several properties in Sunset Park and Councilmember Manchaca's district in Brooklyn. Land use item 226 relates to several blocks and lots in Community District 7 containing 21 buildings known as Sunset Park 1. Land use item 227 relates to several blocks and lots in Community District 7 containing 13 buildings known as Sunset Park 2. Land use item 228 relates to block 816, lot 42 in Community District 7 containing two buildings known as Sunset Park 3. Land use item 229 relates to two blocks and lots in Community District 7 containing three buildings known as Sunset Park 4. All the buildings in four applications provide rental housing for low-income families. In 2017, the council approved a 30-year Article 11 tax exemption pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law, which coincided with the 30-year term of regulatory agreement. HPD and the new owners will amend the regulatory agreement to amend the restriction period from 30 to 40 years, and accordingly, HPD is requesting that the tax exemption be extended. I would like to open the public hearing on Sunset Park 1, 2, 3, and 4. I would like to invite HPD uh, to present. If you have not already testified, please uh, state your name for the record. Carolyn Williams, HPD. John Tatum. John Tatum, Fairstead. Victoria Goose, Fairstead. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Still yes. Okay. You may begin. I need to uh, step out for a moment, but I will return to ask questions. You want? You don't want us to wait? It's fine. Okay. All right. Land use items number uh, 226, 227, 228, and 229 consist of amendments to council resolutions uh, number 154, 155, 156, and one, sorry, 1554, 1555, 1556, and 1557, which were approved on June 6, 2017. Located in Brooklyn Council District number 38, the four clusters are referred to as the Sunset Park Portfolio. Together, the portfolio contains 42 buildings with 408 units originally approved for disposition and development by the Board of Estimate in the early 1980s as Section 8 HUD multifamily rental housing for low-income families. The resolutions approved on June 6, 2017 provided new tax benefits for the portfolio, as well as conversion from Article 5 housing status to Article 11 HDFCs with 30-year regulatory agreements. On June 13, 2017, the buildings were conveyed to new HDFC entities under Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. In advance of these approvals, HPD and the sponsor worked together to determine the best approach to maintaining the units as low-income rental housing, given a number of potential threats to the portfolio's continued affordability, including HUD mortgages having been satisfied a number of years ago, land disposition agreements that were set to expire in 2022, and the fact that the building's housing assistance program or HAP contracts were set to begin expiring in 2017, and these contracts were the only regulating documents that restricted rents um, to 30% of household income. Therefore, the sponsor obtained council approval to voluntarily terminate their Article 5 housing status and obtain new tax exemptions under Article 11. Currently, the owner is refinancing the existing loan and is requesting to amend the prior resolutions and extend the tax exemptions to 40 years from the current 30-year term. Um, and there's some stuff in the testimony about the blocks and lots for each of the sites, which I will spare you from having me read all of them, but they're here in the written version. 
Um, the unit breakdown across the portfolio includes four superintendent units as well as 17 studios, 159 one-bedroom, 197 two-bedroom, and 35 three-bedroom apartments with no vacancies. Household AMIs at initial occupancy are capped at 50% AMI as per the HOP contract, and tenants pay 30% of adjusted gross household income. The buildings will undergo a moderate rehab, including new kitchens and baths, low flow fixtures, energy efficient lighting, in-unit electrical panels, new closet doors, and custom shelving. There will be upgrades to common areas and the community room, as well as roof, boiler, and window replacements. The work will address any outstanding HPD violations. <coughs> The projects are privately owned and have existing HAP contracts. The HGFCs have retained fee ownership and have conveyed beneficial ownership to four LLCs. In June 2017, the current owners financed the acquisition of the developments with a private loan and investor equity. There is no city subsidy in the project. As indicated, the HGFCs and the LLCs entered into a 30-year HPD regulatory agreement restricting the use of the development to low-income rental housing. Now, HPD will extend the regulatory agreement to be coterminous to the new 40-year exemption term. HPD is requesting that the four prior resolutions be amended by re replacing paragraph 5 with language regarding the expiration date of the Article 11 pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The estimated cumulative value of the tax exemption for the portfolio over the 40-year term is $27,390,671, with a net present value of $9,810,936. This seems like one of the more straightforward. Yep, pretty simple. Just changing the term of the regulatory agreement, adding 10 more years. Um, to coincide with their new refinancing. And uh, so you, we have the property owner here? Yep. Yep. Uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, why you chose to maintain these units as affordable when you could have kicked everybody out and, and tried to go market or what have you. Um. <clears throat> So, Why'd you do the right thing? Well, I guess, I guess I'll just step back just a little bit and say, um, you know, what what Fairstead Affordable or the principles of Fairstead have created a business around doing is finding you know avenues to long term preservation, relating you know to various programs like HUD, RAD, or other things. Um, this particular uh, cluster of properties that we look at as a single property, although in the eyes of HUD is for individual HAP contracts. Um, you know, we acquired. Um, you know, from a, from an owner who had, you know, not um, done I think everything they could, and you know there was an opportunity in working with HPD um, to you know extend the uh, tax abatement, uh, actually go through a new uh, t tax abatement, and um, you know find a path to rehabilitation and, and preservation and long term renewal of the Section Eight contract. Three of the four properties were Article Five, and one was not. Now they're all under Article 11. What is the total project cost for the uh, community room, roof, boilers, windows? So, and this is something that we do in New York and, and all more broadly uh, across the country is that I find it makes sense um, myself, my team, and we go ahead and we actually meet with HUD. So uh, on this pro particular project, um, we went and sat down with HUD Asset Management um, and talked about what are you hearing at these these projects. We sat with council member and Chaka and said, what are you hearing, sort of boots on the ground? And what was asked of us is, how can you find a way to do more rehab? Um, we were initially targeting somewhere in the two to four million dollar range, and the, the ask was, how can you do more? And so we looked around at the various financing structures that were available, and the one that we found uh, when paired with a longer term tax abatement uh, to be the most effective was this something called the HUD 223F loan. And uh, the programmatic requirement under that loan is a tax agreement at at least the same length as the amortization, which is 35 years or, or beyond. And so while initially we had done a 30-year uh, agreement, we needed, uh, as part of this refinancing, to extend it 10 years so that the term of the uh, Article 11 was longer than uh, the loan that we would get from, from HUD. And by doing this, this refinancing, we're able to invest somewhere closer to a 
call it $13.5 million uh, in the project. We'll touch 100% of the units, um, all the common areas, most of the plant systems, you know, half the roofs, uh, a very extensive rehab. <coughs> Victoria, anything to add? Um, no, that sounds great. What additional sources of funding do you have beyond the uh, Article 11? None. Well, we have we have the the HUD loan, which is what we're applying for at this time. So HUD's gonna look. So you have the Article 11 plus the 13 million dollar HUD loan. Is that a a loan that gets forgiven by HUD, or do you actually have to pay back that 13 million? Uh, so, sorry, I understand your question. So when we acquired this portfolio of properties, um, we assumed existing financing, plus or minus between the four properties, so it was 63 million dollars. We invested our own capital to, I think, total acquisition costs and rehab reserves and everything else was n around $97.5 million. Um, you know, based on interest rates and where you, you know, work through with HUD, we expect the final loan amount to be, you know, around $95 million. It uh, could be a, a little bit more. Um, and we're going to invest you know, call it 14 million plus soft cost design, architect, uh, relocation reserves. We have a relocation specialist that, that we work with who, um, you know, manages all the resident relocation throughout the project and other things like that. And so I think total capitalization when it's all said and done is plus or minus a hundred. Yeah, about 95 to a hundred million dollars all in and including the 13 to 14 million that we'll be putting in is as rehab. And that's really funded through, you know, first mortgage through HUD and then our own equity. Um, those are the only sources of funds. The developer equity is $13 million? $13, $14? No. Right now, um, 35 call it, we have in the project. Um, so it's 35 plus an additional 15 or is that? We can get you the exact source and use. Um, that's because yeah, there's between soft costs and everything else. I just want to get you the right number. Okay. A any any other state or federal dollars? LHTC, anything like that? No. Okay. I didn't see this in in the testimony, so I'll just uh, go through some of the other pieces, which are just uh, if you can share your project your total project costs, your hard costs and soft costs, and, and supplemental submissions? Yes, we can provide that. Un unless you know it off the top of your head. Uh, in terms of the, sorry, just getting to that section of my uh, spreadsheet. So it's a question that you heard me ask a number of other folks. In terms of the people who will be doing this $100 million in work, uh, will they be able to afford to live in your affordable housing? We'll be paying them uh, at least uh, 30, 50 percent of AMI. Uh, I, I hope that you'll actually be paying them more than that. Will they be getting wages that are commensurate with others? Will they have training? Will they have the ability to get uh, free training, will they have access to health insurance if they get hurt on the, hurt on the job, they can go to a doctor, uh, disability benefits so if they can't come back to work they're taken care of and will they be able to retire with a pension and that's both for people building the project as well as maintaining it afterwards? So, so I think you're asking two questions, but let me know if mm -hmm. uh, I'm wrong. One is, you know, this is project-based Section 8 housing and um, the rules uh, about project-based are fairly clear. Um, you know, we have a tenant selection plan. There are opportunities when our wait list is not closed to open it up um, for people to apply. I, you know, I cannot say at any given time when uh, those wait lists, it's, it's very competitive to get Section 8 housing. Um, people generally do not leave. This is a very low turnover neighborhood, um, and we historically have not turned over very many apartments. We wouldn't expect that to change in the future. So I can't say that anyone... The apartment was about the workers, not... The, sorry, it. the question wasn't about the uh, units, it was about the workers and their compensation. So we can job. check with the one of our main subs who handles you know, in-unit work. We have, you know, HUD has requirements on, you know, 
general contractor liability insurance and other things. Um, we can follow up after that. Uh, I'm going to guess that if it's HUD that it has uh, prevailing wage requirements. The staff at the site are all 32 BJ. The supers, the porters are required by HUD to be union members. Correction, that's local too, but yes, all of the staff members, well, all local of the Local two of which? Uh, local two. There are four superintendents and um, porters, and all of them are union members. Uh, it, you, does it, it's just local too? Does it have a? Yeah, we, we checked in with our management team before and they told us it was a local two uh, union in, in Brooklyn and that's, that's the union that we have a contract with and that the staff members are a part of. And, and th so they get a prevailing wage, they have health insurance, they have disability insurance and that's a pension. That's correct, yes. And they also have access to training and hiring hall. They have access to all of the resources of the union. Okay, uh, and then is your organization an MWBE? If you're not able to certify as an MWBE, what is the makeup of your board and executives? It is not, uh, it is not MWBE. And, and you happen to know, or would you be willing to submit uh, later just uh, and whether any executives or board members are minorities or women? Sure, we can follow up. Uh, uh, if you are HUD, you, you likely have a, a local hire requirement. How can somebody uh, get a job if they are in the Sunset Park area of Brooklyn? Is, is your question how... Uh, to get a job on this $100 million of work that's happening. Just correction, it's actually $13 million worth of work that's happening. and. I, I right, because a, num a lot of it was debt and, and what? Yeah, I mean, that's all, all the, the hard Thank costs you. that's going into the construction. Um, and with the filing, I'm assuming our general contractor will have information available. Who is the general the, contractor? And our affiliate is the general contractor, but we sub out. We don't have direct trades, so we can provide the information for some of our key subcontractors. Okay. Uh, and I, I think I've asked this of almost everyone who's come before the committee, so to the extent uh, if, if HPD can make sure that when we bring the developers in, they're ready to answer those questions, because if I was watching at home today because I thought I might be able to call somebody and get a job, I'd be highly disappointed that uh, there were not those opportunities. I think, uh, give me one moment. I think those are uh, all of our uh, questions. Thank you for uh, keeping the uh, housing affordable. Is there anyone from the public here to testify? Uh, seeing none, I will now uh, close the public hearing on, land on this land use item and the application will be laid over. This concludes today's hearings. I'd like to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing and members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you.